Yeah, I'm going to start in uh, Psalm 12, verse number 6. Pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So God there is, has promised to preserve his word throughout all generations forever. And uh, the Bible, this is one thing that, that the Bible teaches, that God promised to preserve his word. And um, in another place, uh, Proverbs 30 is another place where that is stated. We've got a proverb, Proverbs chapter 30. So I'm just going to look at a few verses here where it says that God has preserved his word. So uh, chapter, Proverbs 30, chapter, uh, verse number 5 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So there we go. Every word of God is pure. So every word is important. And it says not to add to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And today this other Bible that I have next to me here is the new King James Version. And we're going to put it to the test and see, because I've heard many times that people have said, that the new King James is just as good as the original King James. So we're going to see if that's true or if it will be found a liar. And, uh, and Jesus also said in Matthew 24, you know, in Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And he said it three times in the Gospels, Matthew and Mark and in Luke. There's a similar verse where it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And also in Matthew chapter 5, let's go back a few pages here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18 says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So jot and tittle is like a crossing of the eye, a dotting of the eye or the crossing of a T. Down to that detail is going to be preserved. And then let's look at Luke chapter 16. Luke 16, verse 17 says, And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. So it's easier for the world to end and the universe to be destroyed than even one word or one you know, period in the, in the Bible to be destroyed, right? It won't happen. It will be preserved forever, right? And, um, but the Bible also teaches that that though his word is going to be preserved, that there are, pe there are people that will corrupt the word of God. And the first Bible corrupter we see in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3. I'll start with the first verse. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So this is the, this is the devil's first words are to question the word of God. Right? So, and uh, a lot of these Bible corruptors go right back to Satan when it comes to who is responsible for, for corrupting the word of God, ultimately it goes back to Satan, right? And in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17, says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So as many. It says there's many that corrupt the word of God. 
And today there are many that corrupt the Word of God. There's many versions of the Bible out there, and there's only God did not preserve His Word into a hundred different versions of the Bible. We believe He preserved it into the King James Bible only because God is not the author of confusion, right? So you can't have Bibles that say different things, that have different meanings, and that, but they say, but the new King James is just as good. We've just updated it a little bit, right? So I'm going to be looking at the new King James today. And there's a lot of churches out there too. And if you look at their statement of faith, it'll say, we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. They say the Bible or the scriptures, but they don't mention which version, right? Most of those churches, they don't believe, they're talking about the original autographs, which don't even exist anymore. They only believe that the originals were inspired and that all these modern versions are just as good as any other, right? But we're going to see today if that's true or if that's a lie, right? So the King James is based on uh, a line of translations called the Textus Receptus, which make up 95% of the available Greek New Testament manuscripts in existence. There's about 5,200 total Greek New Testament manuscripts that exist that are part of the Texas Receptus. They all agree with each other, right? So the King James Bible comes from those group of manuscripts. And um, the other Bibles that the King James came came before the King James, like the, the, uh, the Tyndale New Testament, and you had the... There, there was like there was a series of seven Bibles ending. The seventh Bible is the King James, but there was a series of Texas Receptus Bibles where it came from, and it all comes from that same Texas Receptus line of manuscripts. The other modern versions, like the NIV or the NASB, the ESV, etc., they're based on the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. They're called the Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. And other manuscripts, which are, is a total of 45 manuscripts. It's only a small percentage of the total existing manuscripts are, the, are what these modern versions are based on. The uh, sign, and one interesting thing, I, like I originally thought that the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus was, was like similar to the Texas Receptus, which is like a group of manuscripts, but in fact, the Sinaiticus, the Codex Sinaiticus itself, is one single copy of the Bible. And the same thing with the Codex Vaticanus. It is what the Vatican had on, in storage. It's one Bible, right? So a lot of these Bibles are using only one, two Bibles, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus, because those two Bibles don't agree with each other. They, they have different pieces of it missing, so they have to put them together to get a full Bible out of it. So that is why they use the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus to get one Bible. But even those two Bibles don't, don't agree with each other on everything. There's, there's contradictions between them. Um, the Sinaiticus, there's some history on the Sinaiticus. Uh, I was, I'm, I've been reading this book called Is the World's Oldly, Oldest Bible a Fake? It's by uh, David Daniels. He works for Chick Publications, and it's a good book. Um, he appears to be preach, he appears to be a believer of the correct gospel as well, and he he tells us about what where the Sinaiticus came from, right? So I'm just going to quote from that book about there's a story about where this where they got the Sinaiticus from that is taught in universities, seminaries, and even even churches. So this is the common story that they tell about it. It says, supposedly a world-renowned text collector and Greek expert, Constantine von Tischendorf, discovered in a waste bin destined for the fire a number of Greek parchment uh, sheets older than any he had ever seen. He then dramatically rescued them from the flames in 1844 and took those 21 and a half sheets, they're just 21 and a half sheets of paper, uh, I guess they're scrolls or whatever, back to Germany, and he called them the Codex Frederico Augustanus, C- or CFA. In 1853, so another nine years later, Tischendorf returned, but claimed he couldn't find any more sheets. And then he came back in 1859. 
he came back to this monastery in 1859 with a Russian Orthodox delegation, and he gave a monk there one of Tischendorf's own printed Septuagints, and in return, Tischendorf received the monk's prized possession wrapped in a red cloth. This was the Codex Sinaiticus. Tischendorf claimed he had the Codex sent to him in Cairo. Then he transcribed the entire text with the help of two unnamed Germans who just happened to be in Cairo and one who just happened to read Greek, all completed in the near miraculous space of just two months. They translated the entire Codex Sinaiticus in two months. Then Tischendorf, with the help of printing experts in his adopted town of Leipzig, Germany, made typeface replicas of the letters, both large and small. He decided which words should be in the text and which should be in footnotes, and prepared and published all but the CFA, which was those original 21 and a half sheets, for grand exhibition in 1862. As a result, Tischendorf received numerous accolades, commendations, and honoring compliments, including by the Pope himself. After that, the Pope, with his Jesuit Cardinal May, invited Tischendorf to see the grand prize of the Vatican, Codex Vaticanus, which Tischendorf transcribed and printed in 1867. These texts, the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, became the basis for a new Greek text picked by Westcott and Hort as their basis to create new English Bible versions such as the Revised Version of 1881, the American Standard of 1901, and hundreds of changed Bible versions ever since. And to me, that story is more believable than the story that Joseph Smith told when he said he received the golden plates from the angel Mor- Morini for the, uh, the, uh, the, Mormon, the Mormon church. It's kind of um, hard to believe this actually happened, but most, so the Sinaiticus was rescued out of a waste bin of a monastery. They were going to burn it. It was so bad they were going to burn it. And that's what they're using for the basis of all these false modern Bibles, including the New King James. Let's go to the next page here. So is the New King James good enough? Because everyone says it's, it's just as good. And... Um, I'm going to look here now at the what the editors say are telling us. Because at the beginning of most Bibles, you have a, a preface from the editors. And uh, first of all, there's a, this Bible I found in my in the library downstairs, where we in the building where we live. There's a library similar to the one they have here. Anyone can come and take and leave books, right? This one is the new the. Possibility Thinker's Edition of the New King James, which is ed- the executive editor is Robert Schuler. You may have heard of Robert Schuler from the the Crystal Cathedral. He used to preach. He used to have the uh, Crystal Cathedral on TV. He was a big TV preacher back in the 80s and 90s. And uh, yeah, so this this came from his ministry, the Special Hour of Power Edition. <laughs> so it, like they they would say, you know. If you donate $50 to the ministry, then we'll send you one of these type thing, right? So at the end of his introduction, he says that we have retained the most classic of all English translations, the King James Version, with limited new revisions to carry the title, the New King James Version. So he's saying it's just a little little couple of changes here and there, you know, just to update it to modern English. And now we're going to look at what the... And this translation was done in 1975 by the Thomas Nelson Company. So this is a Thomas Nelson published Bible. And they're responsible for coming up with the new King James. And in their preface, um, they they said that, um, you know, the King James terms, some of the terms like propitiation, justification, sanctification have been retained except where the original language indicates the need for a more precise translation. So they're saying that the King James is not precise enough, right? So they're saying, they're actually saying the new King James is better, right? And it also says, they all they go on about which text, the Greek text, and they said, 
they, uh, they, they realize that there's these other Greek texts called the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, but there's a big controversy over them, so you know people are, don't like them, and they often disagree with one another. So they're saying the majority of the texts are the, the you know the Textus Receptus, and they're saying that uh, you know this Bible, they're saying that uh, this New King James New Testament has been based on this received text thus perpetuating the tradition begun in William, by William Tyndale in 1525 and continued by the 1611 translators in rendering the authorized version. But important textual variants are recorded in the footnotes. So they're saying that they used the Textus Receptus only to produce this translation, but there's footnotes all over the Bible that point to the Codex Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, right? So it'll, you'll be reading along, and you'll see a little footnote, and it'll say, you know, the, uh, the best, the oldest manuscripts say this. You know, it'll, it'll say something, right? And it'll, have, it'll tell you what the other versions say, basically. Right. So let's see. This here looks like a Bible, but I believe it is a counterfeit Bible. And the worst counterfeits, the best counterfeits, are going to be very similar to the original with only a few minor changes, right? So the changes in the New King James are less changes than you'll see in most modern versions. It'll be trying to be as close to, as they can to the original to try and trick people into the, using this instead. And um, they even come out with a parallel Bible the King James, New King James Parallel Bible, and on the back cover of the Bible where it tells you what it's all about, it says this is the perfect Bible for those who are looking for a new modern translation to come to transition from the King James to a modern version. So it's sort of like this is like an intermediate version. They want you to come off the King James into here, and then from here you can go to the NIV, the ESV, and other, other Bibles because they agree with this, right? So it's, they're trying to get people off of the King James, right? So let's look. So the one, one of the main changes they've, they've made in all the other uh, modern versions is that they, you know, the, where it says that they have these, the these, the thous, the these and the thous, and everyone's complaining, oh, I don't like the these and the thous, and the, the word ye, right? Only the King James has those, the, the thee, thou, and yees, right? And it's a, but the problem is you cannot have a, a perfect translation without those words, because the thee and thou are singular, but ye is plural, right? So if you replace thee, thou, and ye, they're all replaced by one word, you, right? So if you replace thee and thou with you, or ye with you, you're losing all the precision that you have with the thee, and the thou, and the ye, because you know thee and thou is singular. Ye is plural, and it's always talking about a group of people when, it, when you see ye, right? All of those are translated to the word you, so you're losing a lot of information right off the bat, right? Which all modern versions do, right? They all lose that. So, for example, in John chapter 3, I'm just going to go to John chapter 3 in here in the New King James. You can go to it in your King James, and we'll see what it says here. John chapter 3. So John chapter 3, verse 3, in this Bible it says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he's talking to Nicodemus. He says, I say to you. So notice it just says you. But in the King James, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, so he's talking, to, he's saying thee to Nicodemus. So he's talking to Nicodemus as a single, single person. Yeah, he can marvel. So he's talking to Nicodemus. And then in verse 7, it says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So, so in, the, in 3, in the New King James, when it says, I say to you, you don't really know... It could be he talking to one person or more. 
You don't know, right? But you know from the King James that it's the. So you're talking just to Nicodemus. But then in verse 7 it says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again, right? So he's talking to Nicodemus, but he's saying ye. Whereas in the New King James it says, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So you don't know. From that, you don't know who he's talking. You think he's just talking to Nicodemus there. But in fact, he's talking to everybody. Ye must be born again. That's plural. It means he's talking to everybody reading the Bible, saying everyone must be born again, right? And in verse 11, it says, in the King James, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify with that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Whereas in the New King James, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. So it leads you to believe he's just talking to Nicodemus there, but he's really talking about all the Pharisees. Because Nicodemus was a Pharisee, right? He's talking, he's saying ye. So more than one person are not receiving his witness. So you're, it's more precise, the King James, right? And then uh, there's another example of this in Exodus chapter 16. Let me go to Exodus 16, where God is talking to Moses. Sixteen, verse twenty-eight. Let's get to it in this. So, in verse twenty-eight, it says, "And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws?" So, in the New King James, let me just get to that now. Sixteen. Verse 28 in the New King James says, And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you re refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? So, and David Daniels, and the guy that wrote the book, told a story about this where his son came to him and said, Dad, why is God mad with Moses here? And because his son was using the New King James. Because it says, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments? But in the King James, it says, how long refuse ye to keep my commandments? He's talking to all of Israel. He's not just talking only to Moses. He's not talking to Moses. He's talking about all of Israel there, so, which makes more sense, right? Because they weren't, they were refusing to keep the, keep the commandments and the laws, right? So it's, you're losing a lot. You, you can be, you know, misled just by the these and the nows are not there, right? So... That, but that alone, you know, the people that like the new King James, they're going to say, well, you know, we could figure it out. We can figure it out from the context if he's talking to one person or more, right? So let's go now to the fact that there's footnotes in here. And I'm going to get, get to an example of where there's a footnote. Matthew 7, or no, Matthew 17. Takes longer in here. I don't have tabs in this one. So. Matthew 17. Verse 21. Now Jesus is talking to the disciples. The disciples are asking why they couldn't cast out a demon, right? And um, yeah, let me go to that here too. Matthew. 17, 21. Okay, so Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. So verse 21 there. This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. There's a little 81, footnote number 81, it says, New text omits this verse. So the New Text is talking about Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. 
they don't they don't have all the verses that the King James does. So they've kept the King James verses, but they're putting footnotes saying, okay, well, the other version omits this verse. So it's casting doubt, right? So you're thinking, well, but if those are the earliest and best, you know, then maybe, you know, maybe the King James, it's leading people to think that maybe the King James is wrong, right? So that's the footnote there. And then in Matthew 16, or Mark 16 is, is even, Mark 16 is the resurrection chapter. Mark 16. Okay, so in the King James, Mark 16 has, and it also has the, the Great Commission is in there as well. So it's 20 verses, right? And uh, in, the, in the New King James, the footnote says, verses 9 to 20 are bracketed in new texts, the other texts, as not original. They are lacking in Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, though nearly all other manuscripts of Mark contain them. So it's saying that all the other manuscripts don't even have verses 9 through 20. So in the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, Mark 16 en ends with verse 8. It just says, And they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid, right? So yeah, Mark 16. So we're missing, those other manuscripts are missing the Great Commission, they're missing the resurrection where G when Jesus was risen, you know, and um, there's all those verses are missing from the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, but they've, they've graciously kept it, you know, so, but they're casting doubt on it. And, uh, you know, people like uh, Dr. James White, who uses the ESV, he doesn't think that those verses 9 to 20 should even be there, right? He doesn't believe that they're, that they're supposed to be in the Bible at all. So these footnotes are just casting doubt on, on the Word of God, right? It's causing people to doubt the King James Version when they see these footnotes. So if we go to Luke 9... Chapter 9, verse 56. Yeah. Luke 9, 56. Okay. And these omissions seem to be fairly, like, targeted. Like, there are certain important verses that are missing. So, Luke... 9:56 says for the son of man has not come to destroy men's lives but to save them and they went to another village and the and the footnote says number 74 the footnote says the other manuscripts omit the first sentence of this verse so those ones and you'll see it in the NIV and the ESV whatever it all it says is and they went to another village <laughs> it doesn't say for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. That's missing from a lot of the modern versions. It's here in the New King James, but there's a footnote there. And they're casting doubt, right? Let me go on the next page. And there's another one in Luke 23. This is a big one. Luke 23. Verse 34, and I know King uh, uh, Dr. James White says that this verse should not be in any Bible. It's like the earliest manuscripts don't have it. It says, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So in here it says, it brackets the first sentence of verse 34. So it, all it says in the modern versions, it says, and they divided his garments and cast lots. It doesn't say... The Father forgive them verse isn't there in the modern versions, and it's footnoted here. So, oh, did he really say that? James White doesn't think so, but the King James Bible has it. All right, so Acts 8. 
version uh, verse 37 in Acts 8. This is an important salvation verse that they're casting doubt on here. So Acts 8, 37. Uh, 36, this was when Philip was uh, preaching to the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch. And he says, in 36 it says, and they, as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all mine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So the footnote to verse 37. Where is that? It's here. Says the other the other manuscripts omit this verse. So the verse 37 is missing from a lot of the modern versions. So all it says is, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And they skip verse 37, and then they go to verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So you're missing the part where it has to be a believer's baptism, right? In the modern versions, it seems like it could be any, nothing's hindering him to be baptized. He doesn't have to believe, according to that, like according to the modern versions, you know. And, and the new King James has it, but they're casting doubt by saying that the other the other manuscripts are missing this verse. So there's another similar type of footnote in here, which is where they've made the changes in the new King James, and then but then the footnotes show the original, what they what what it used to say. So that's uh, First Chronicles chapter 20. First Chronicles 20. And I'll go to that in here too. Okay, so verse, it's verse 3. Uh, is it verse 3? Yeah, 20 verse 3. Okay, yeah, I got the wrong one. Okay. It says, And he brought out the people that were in it, and cut them with saws, and with harrows of iron, and with axes. Even so dealt David with all the cities of the children of Ammon. And David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. So in the New King James, it says, And he brought out the people who were in it, and put them to work with saws, with iron picks, and with axes. So David did to all the cities of the people of Ammon. And so he put them to work in the New King James. But then it has a footnote where it says the Septuagint reads cut them. And also the King James says cut them with saws. So it's, there's a big difference there. Either he, did he cut them in half <laughs> or did he put them to work? Yeah. Seems like David's a little bit being a little bit more generous over in the New King James, <laughs> right? Because he's not killing people. In here, he's just putting them to work. <laughs> so it's quite a difference there. Uh, and they don't, and and they they claim that this is coming from the Textus Receptus. Oh, but the Septuagint says cut them. You know, so it's they're sort of lying to you there, um, because that's not coming out of the Textus Receptus. It's coming from the modern versions. And then the other verse I found, which is Proverbs chapter 18. There's a big difference in Proverbs chapter 18. Verse 8. It says, The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. And the New King James says, The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles, and they go down into the inmost body. So the King James says, the words of it is as wounds, but the New King James says tasty trifles. It's quite a difference there <laughs> in meaning, right? So the tail bearing is like gossiping, right? So the King James says they're like, it's not good. It sounds like they're making gossip something that you want to do 
making it, a ta- you know, you like to hear the gossip. It's like a tasty trifle, right? And it says, you know, a Jewish tradition reads wounds. So saying the Jewish tradition says it's, it says wounds, but, uh, you know, they're claiming the Texas Receptus says tasty trifles, but if you compare it against the, the real King James, it's not that. It says wounds, you know. So they're outright lying to you about what, you know, what that verse says. And now, and so they're starting to get into the part where they're, you know, do this outright lies, right? I, this is where they're trying to push this counterfeit version as the real thing. So there's no, there's some verses that have no footnotes. They have changes in doctrinal, they have doctrinal changes, differences in meanings, right? This is where you find out the difference between the real thing and the counterfeit, trying to pass itself off as the real thing. So one of those is in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22. Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together. The new King James says, 22, 8. And Abraham said, My son... God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, and the two of them went together. There's, a, there's quite a difference in meaning there. In the King James, it says he's providing himself as a lamb. God himself will be the lamb. It's that prophecy of Jesus Christ there. But in the New King James, he's just providing for himself a lamb, some other lamb, right? It's, it's, it's a, there's a difference in meaning there, and you lose the prophecy part of it. He's just providing it for himself. But... And the real thing, it's providing himself, because God himself came down from heaven as the lamb, right, to pay for our sins on the cross. Quite a difference. And, there, and there, there's no footnotes there. It's, they're saying that that's what it should say. And then the next one is Deuteronomy 31. Verse 26. Deuteronomy 31, 26. It says, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may may be there for a witness against thee. Okay, 3226, Deuteronomy. Okay, something's wrong with that. Am I in the right? Deuteronomy, oh, 3126. Okay, I'm in the wrong chapter. 3126 says, Take this book of the law and put it in the side in the side of the Ark of the Covenant. So, thirty-one twenty-six says says Take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. So, thirty-one twenty-six just says, you know, take it and put it next to the Ark of the Covenant. Whereas the King James says. Put this book of the law in the side of the Ark of the Covenant. So sort of like a pocket. Like in, it's a difference between putting it here in, in like a pocket and then or just like throwing it on the floor next to the next to the Ark. That's what the New King James says, just put it next to the Ark. That sounds like a secure location for it. Right? So there's a difference there. And uh, first Chronicles 29. First Chronicles 29, verse 15. <coughs> 29, 15. For, for we are strangers before thee and so, sojourners as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow and there is none abiding. So now we will see what the New King James says about it. 
For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. So it says without hope in the New King James, and it says there is none abiding in First Chronicles. So that's, that's quite a difference there, with being without hope versus there is none abiding. There's a big change there. I don't, I don't know how they get that out of this, if they're using the same manuscript, right? Okay, so let's go to Second Kings, working my way through the Bible here. Second Kings 23, verse 29. And this is where it actually has a outright error in history. Second Kings 23, 29. So this verse alone should discount the whole New, New King James altogether. Because if it's the perfect word of God, then it cannot have any errors in it. But I'm going to look here. If I can get to the verse here. 2 Kings 23. Uh, doesn't want to do it. There's one page there. There we go. So it says in the King James, it says, In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him, and he slew him at Megiddo when he had seen him. So that's the King James. And in, the, in this one, the new King James, it says, In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Syria to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo when he confronted him. So it's saying he went to the aid of the king of Assyria, but in the King James it says he went up against him. So the, the, either they're allies or they're enemies. They can't be both, right? One says they're allies, the other says enemies. But the chronology of Eusebius, he has this chronology of all the events in the Bible. According to the chronology of Eusebius at the time, and I think it was 690 BC or something, at the time this happened, the Pharaoh and the king of Assyria were enemies, not allies. So the King James is correct. This has an error in it saying that they were allies, right? They went to the aid. He went to the aid. So that's a complete error in history, in proven history, that this cannot be the perfect word of God. It's just that verse, one verse alone because it cannot have any errors. If it, if it was the perfect word of God, it can't have any, even one error, it cannot be perfect, right? So now, let's see. Isaiah chapter 9. So, so far, I don't think it's good enough. It's not as good. It's definitely not as good so far. And it's going to get worse. So Isaiah chapter 9, verse 3, Isaiah 9, 3. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy and harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Okay, verse 3 in the New King James says, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. It's almost exactly the same, except the King James says not increased its joy, and the New King James says it did incre it increased its joy. So it's complete opposite of what it's saying in the King James. Uh, you know, it's obviously trying to pass itself off as a you know, it, but it's putting subtle differences in there. This is, has nothing to do with modernizing the English because the English in these two versions is almost identical. It's just one one's op means opposite of the other one. So we're catching them here deliberately trying to corrupt what it says. All right, so Ecclesiastes 3. This is the last one in the Old Testament that I'm going to look at. 
And there's dozens of these changes all over the place. If you had a parallel Bible, you could look at it side by side and see what the differences are. But there's a lot of them. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. It says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. All right, so chapter 3, verse 11 in the New King James says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also he has put eternity in their hearts except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So let's see, verse 11 here. He set the world in their heart, whereas over here it's eternity in their hearts. It's quite different. Quite different here. Um, changing the meaning of that verse. So let's go to the New Testament now. Matthew chapter 7. This is where it gets, the changes get more of an attack on salvation related verses that's in the New Testament. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Matthew 7, okay, so it says, verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few that be that find it. So here in the New King James it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there is many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So the, the King James says it's narrow. Salvation is the narrow way. The New King James says... Difficult is the way which leads to life, making salvation hard instead of easy. It's a works. Yeah, you're looking at works right there. It's, it's, if it's hard to be saved, you got to be doing something, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's difficult, and a lot of the, most of the other modern versions have the same thing where it says difficult, because that's coming out of the Sinaiticus. The Codex Sinaiticus says difficult. So Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verse 40, is something that the King James reveals, but the, this one does not reveal. There's some truth that it reveals, something that you miss when you have a modern version. So let me go to is it Matthew 12. Yeah, Matthew 12, okay. Okay, so 40, okay. Matthew 12, 40. In the New King James, it says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So in the original, in the King James, it says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So in the King James, we find out that the, the cuz in Jonah it only says great fish it doesn't say whale but we're finding out in Matthew that it's actually a whale and that's the only place we know that it was actually a whale it's, it's revealed in the new testament but in the new king james all it says is great fish so you're losing that extra revelation that you get from the king james bible so we're losing a little bit of information there all right so let's go to Luke Chapter 3. Just going forward here to Luke 3. Luke 3, verse 14. Okay. Let me just throw Says, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? 
And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And in the New King James it says, Likewise the soldiers asked him, and saying, What shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone, or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. So in the King James it says, Do violence to no man. The other one it says, Just don't intimidate anyone. Right? As long as you don't intimidate, you can you can do violence to them, right? <laughs> yeah, it's different. All right, let's go to Acts chapter three. Acts chapter three, verse twenty-six. There's an attack on the deity of Christ in this verse, in the New King James. It says, unto you, unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And the New King James says, to you first, God, having raised up his servant, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning every one you, of you from your iniquities. So it's calling him his servant. So it's instead of his son. The son part is, is, is important, right? He wasn't just a servant. He was the son of God. And if someone like in a false cult sees, oh, he's just the son, of, he's just the servant of God. He's not God, right? He's just a servant. So you can see where it leads some of these other groups and uh, false cults to believe that he's not God, right? Because some people don't believe he's God at all, right? And uh, one, of the, uh, yeah, one of the salvation-related verses is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is one of the fingerprints of a counterfeit when you see the, the verse and, and what they're um, changing it to. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now here it is. Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So in the New King James, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So in the New King James, salvation is a process and not a one-time event. You're being saved, just like how the Catholics are working their way to heaven, just like how they're trying to make salvation difficult. You're being saved in the New King James, but in the King James, us who are saved, right? Past tense. It's a one-time event. As it says in John 5, 24, that once you're saved, you have passed from death unto life, and you have eternal life. Present tense. Whereas the New King James wants you to believe that it's a process, a lifelong process. And this is one of the you know, major changes. And they even try to, they even try to hide uh, the fact that they're trying to corrupt the Word of God. Because as uh, the verse that I s- said at the beginning, 2 Corinthians 2, 17, which says there are many that corrupt the Word of God. In the King James it says... There are many who peddle the word of God. They change corrupt to peddle, right? <laughs> just Oh, they're just selling it, right? Right. So they're trying to cover up the fact that they're corrupting the word of God, right? So there's many of these changes that are not foot, footnoted. They're trying to pass it off as the real thing. So this, to me, means that it's a counterfeit. And as it said in, in uh, Proverbs 30, Add not thou unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So we're finding that the new King James is a liar when it comes to some of these verses that they've made changes to. And they claim that it came from the Textus Receptus, but we know it did not. So in Revelation 22, and it's a very serious thing to change the word of God, because in Revelation 22, there's a warning against doing that. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. This is 
You know, if you change the word of God, that's proof that you were never saved to begin with because you can't lose your salvation, but nobody who's saved is going to make changes to the, to the word. Otherwise, it's saying here, God shall take your part out of, the, out of the book of life. So if anyone makes a change, it's proof to me that they were never saved to begin with. Right? So let's see, Peter one twenty three. And Peter, 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we need to be saved by an incorruptible seed, not by an imperfect modern version that has all these changes in it, obvious salvation-related changes to it. And, you know, the reason they're doing this, too, is they want a one-world religion, right? So they have to get people off of the King James because the King James makes salvation a one-time event, makes it easy, but the modern versions make it difficult and they're trying to say it's a process. So they need you to get off of the King James onto other modern versions and this Gateway Bible, the new King James, is what they're using to do it. And I came across a, an article by Manley P. Hall. He wrote it in, eight, in 1944. He wrote an article in his one of his publications. Now he was an occultist. He was not a believer. He's basic, he's an occultist. He worships Satan, basically. And what he's saying is that for the last hundred years, we've been trying to get people off that King James Version. Because people think it's the infallible word of God. We've got to get them away from that. And guess what came out a hundred years before he wrote that article? It was the Codex Sinaiticus. It came 100 years before Manly P. Hall. So Manly P. Hall was saying, in order to have a one world religion, you need to get people out of that. You need to get them off the King James, right? They're trying to get you off of that. So if you think that the King James, that the modern versions of the King James are just as good, you're just falling into the trap that the, the devil is laying for everybody to try and get out of that and try to get away from the truth, right? So we need to, like, you know, any time someone comes and tells you, well, the new King James is just as good, I say, no, it's not. It's not just as good. It's a counterfeit. So we need to be aware that these counterfeits are out there, and there are many churches using them. Um, there are, you know, seminaries that are teaching it. The guy that wrote the book uh, is the oldest Bible um, by Chick Publications. Is the world's oldest Bible a fake? He thinks it's a fake. It's a forgery, and it's not even as old as what they claim, because they claim it came from like, you know, 400 A.D. or way back. But he thinks that it was actually a modern forgery. So they're clearly trying to just lie to you, and it's not just as good. And I'll leave it at that.